Um, I'm Reverend Hannah Capaldi. My pronouns are she and her, and I uh, serve as the Minister for Faith Formation here at First Unitarian Church. On Friday, November 6th, which was just over a week ago, I got some disappointing news from my doctor. Livia and I have been trying to have a baby and it hasn't been going very well. It was early morning and I had already been pricked and prodded. And as I sat in the car crying with Liv, she asked, what would make you feel better? Our usual go-tos for improved mood right now are like a donut or a breakfast sandwich. And that didn't really feel like it would cure this sense of heaviness I felt this sense of sadness for myself and for us. And then I knew, I knew what I needed to do. I needed to go to the convention center. I needed Livia to take me there immediately. I put on my clergy shirt and I went to Duncan and I picked up a box of Joe and 50 munchkins like the good New Englander that I am. And I said, take me to the party of the people. She dropped me off a block away, and with every step closer to the buzz, I felt lifted. I focused on getting the hospitality table set up with the donated food and drinks, getting myself situated into a role that would immediately feel useful. And soon I was feeding people. I was pouring coffee and gently loving on folks in a way that comes only when you meet their immediate physical needs. And I had physical needs in that moment too. I needed in my body to be reminded of goodness in this world, that I still had goodness to give even when I was deeply sad. And it only got better as the minutes passed. The atmosphere intensified with an elated block party kind of like feel. The sun shone extra bright that day, unseasonably perfect for our gathering. Someone burnt sage and waved it about as they danced while the DJ played hits by Stevie Wonder and Prince. The rising feeling in my body was joy. I began to feel lifted. I began to feel good. I began to see just how poignantly beautiful the scene before me was. And let me tell you about God in that moment. You think you don't believe in the spirit and then it catches you. You think you don't believe in the spirit and then something compels you downtown to dance in the sunshine, to pray with your colleagues and hear their power, to chant. When Rabbi Ari Lev of Kolsetic showed up, he said, the klezmer band is right behind me. And soon on one end of the block was a DJ bumping Beyonce and on the other was a lively crew of a clarinet and a dulcimer and an accordion. And when I turned to, our, to Rabbi Ari Lev and said, I feel incredible. He said, I feel the best I felt in four years. My face hurt from smiling behind my mask. The crowd continued to grow as word spread that something really amazing was happening downtown at the convention center. Folks showed up in costume, dressed as mailboxes, dressed as cheerleaders, dressed like they were ready to party. And the DJ, you think you don't believe in the spirit until the DJ makes magic, playing your favorite song until that segues into your actual favorite song. But oh wait, the third one they play, that's truly your favorite song. And it goes like that for an hour. That's joy too. That feeling of someone knowing how to make you move, knowing how to make a crowd come alive with rhythm. That joyful feeling of being known, of being ushered along into a moment of ecstasy. There was so much joy in that crowd. There was joy in our numbers, joy that we had turned out and turned up so that we could feel less alone in our anger and our anxiety. There was joy in our movement, the carefree and rhythmic time we kept with our bodies in the sunshine. There was joy in our protest, the way wherever you looked, there were smiling people wearing shirts that said, count every vote. And art, 
that proclaimed that Black Lives Matter and babies everywhere in backpacks. There were union members and teachers and nurses. There were houseless folks and teenagers and grandparents. There was an astonishing cross-section of Philadelphia to behold. I'm trying so hard to paint this scene for you because I need you to feel what I felt that day. It was a baptism for me. I swam in the holy waters of joy, of joyful resistance, and I came out of it different than I went in. In joyful militancy, building thriving resistance in toxic times, Carla Bergman and Nick Montgomery write, straight from the anarchist library, joy does not come about by avoiding pain, but by struggling amidst and through it. Those days at the convention center were not without pain. They were not without struggle, for just beyond the barricade stood a group of Trump supporters, loudly waving their own flags and chanting their own chants. By Friday, a deeper canal had been set between the two parties, guarded by 30 cops with bikes. And they waved flags that recalled the white supremacy of the administration. And they wore clothing designed to mimic the military, to intimidate. And they held signs that degraded us. The cops themselves wore masks that backed the blue, the ones with the flag with the blue stripe. And it made me feel queasy to watch them broadcast their tacit approval of the chants and the signs behind them. Couldn't they just have worn surgical masks? Sometimes there would be a break in the music or a time of spoken word or prayer or a speech and through the crowd, you could hear the cries of voter fraud. You could hear the cries of hate. And we pushed through that pain. We didn't avoid it but we dug in our heels and we danced and we sang and we beat drums and we waved tambourines. For a while, I marshaled between the two sides, walking up and down the canal between to monitor and deescalate as was necessary. I kept inviting folks to join the party. Come, come over onto this side instead of shouting at the Trump supporters, instead of feeding the beast. And while there was stress and tension there, what I noticed most of all in this joyful resistance of a block party was the juxtaposition between the two sides. Here was holy joy. Here was people power rising up to nonviolently protest and laid side by side with vitriol. It looked better. It looked fun. It looked appealing to anyone and everyone who walked by. Would you rather be of joy or of anger? Our irrepressible spirit of celebration made the other side look small. It made the other side look weak. It was a tactic, a strategy that had no double edge to it. We got to be happy and we got to get our point across. This joy, it didn't come about by happenstance. It was planned and credit should go to the hardworking organizers and the brilliant thinkers of the Working Families Party and election defenders who learned and leaned on the teachings of nonviolent resistance to humiliate and shame an opponent rather than sink to their level. This joyful protest, this joy as resistance, joy like step off, joy like you didn't give it to me so you can't take it away. In striding towards freedom, Martin Luther King wrote, for while the nonviolent resistor is passive in the sense that she is not physically aggressive toward the opponent, her mind and emotions are always active, constantly seeking to persuade the opponent that he is wrong. The method is passive physically, but strongly active spiritually. That day down at the convention center and then on Saturday as West Philadelphia in my neighborhood hooped and hollered, Yes, we were celebrating, but we were also resisting. Sometimes they are one and the same and there is deep spirituality in combining the two. In the video clip we heard of the Georgia Mass Choir, you can hear them shouting joy, sweet, beautiful, soul-saving joy. 
soul saving joy is how we embodied nonviolent resistance that day, a soul saving joy that proclaimed we will dance our way to the revolution. I think of joy, of soul saving joy, like a scab. It is the protective layer you grow to shield the wound, to protect the tenderness underneath until it is ready to emerge whole and healed again. The scab of joy is necessary. It is required to sustain the fight. You'll be sidelined with your injuries otherwise. Joy in that, that in the moment, unself-conscious excitement at your own existence, it is soul-saving because it preserves the soul. It preserves that part of you that hopes, that part of you that lifts your eyes to the horizon and that looks beyond the present. Joy protects, and it is soul saving. When I loosed my throat and let fly a yell so loud I made myself feel dizzy, I was saving my soul. And the good people down at the convention center did it with me, beside me. We did it together. So joy is an insistence. It is a declaration. It is self-preservation. As Audre Lorde said, self-preservation is an act of political warfare. Joy is a tactic and it is a strategy. It is available to us when we need to scab over the wound and push through to the next phase of healing. So do not be mistaken that when you are having fun, that when you are laughing and dancing, when you are feeling good, that's part of the fight too. That's the part of the fight that keeps you in it. Particularly for lives that are under attack for black bodies and undocumented bodies, for bodies with uteruses, for bodies without homes, for disabled bodies, preserving yourself with joy preserves your humanity. It rejects the narrative that your life is only sad and only hard. It subverts the idea that you can be controlled or contained and that if you, they keep their feet on your neck long enough, you'll just give up. That day down at the convention center, I felt part of something much larger, much more powerful than myself. And in this life, that's what I call God. I titled this sermon, Immortal Gladness, after the line in that well-known hymn, Joyful, Joyful. Giver of immortal gladness, fill us with the joy of day. The gladness that is immortal, that cannot be killed, that cannot die. The kind of joy that keeps getting back up, that invites others in with its appeal, that kind of joy that makes you glad, glad to be alive. And on that hard Friday morning, as I came to feel God in that crowd, I was joyful. Joyful at the chance to dance, joyful at the chance to serve, joyful at the chance to show up and try again. And I invite you to joy with me. Seize every opportunity for it, for it is the part of the fight that keeps you in. And we need everyone in the fight. Blessed be. Amen. Hi, I'm Reverend Hannah Capaldi. And I'm Reverend Abby Tennis. We are the ministers at the First Unitarian Church of Philadelphia, where our mission is to awaken love and justice in our lives and in the world. We're so grateful that you watched, and we hope that the sermon connected with your soul. We also want to invite you to join us for a live worship service every Sunday at 11 a.m. Eastern Time. You can always find the link to that service on our website at www.philauu.org. In these services, you'll hear words like you've just heard, and you also get a chance to greet one another, pray together, sing together, and we even hold a virtual coffee hour after services to get a chance to greet some new and old friends. If you want to support the mission of this community and you feel moved to give, you can do so by going to the website that Reverend Abby just mentioned. You can find that link below, or you can text 215-709 5095 and follow the prompts to give. If someone in your life needs to hear these words today, we encourage you to share this video. And again, thank you so much for watching.
We hope to see you soon.